Three, two, one. Hello and welcome along to the Property Academy podcast. I'm your host, Ed McKnight. And I'm Andrew Nicholl. And today on the show, we're talking about negotiation techniques in property. When you're looking to buy a property, you want to get a decent price. So how are you able to negotiate to get that really good price? Now, just before we, we hit play, Andrew and I were talking about his most recent purchase, which is his first home. At the tender age of 36, I'm buying my first home. I'm finally giving up the bachelor pad, which I've resided in for the last nine years, and I'm buying my first house, uh, which is which is a lot more daunting an experience than buying lots of rentals like I've done in the past. And Andrew used some very interesting <laughs> and uh, high-level negotiation techniques, which I thought you'd all get a kick out of. So, Andrew, why don't you tell us the story of how you've bought your first house and how you got a really good price uh, from this. Sure. So I'll start by saying I was tricked into this uh, during lockdown. So so my partner and I had discussed maybe looking at a house this year to live in and she'd sold me on the idea that it was quite a good idea. So I thought, okay, well, how about this? How about we, because I didn't really want to move out of the bachelor pad. How about we find a house that would be a great, you know, long-term house and we'll buy it and we'll rent it out for, you know, a few years until we're ready. <laughs> and she and she said, okay, that's, that's a good idea. And then during lockdown, lo, lo and behold, you know, a couple of weeks after this conversation, she'd found a house. And um, it was a nice house in, uh, in, Christchurch, in Sumner in Christchurch. And, um, and the, the photos looked all right. And so I said, okay, well, when we get out of lockdown, we'll look, we'll look at this. Anyway, a few weeks later, I'm negotiating a contract. So uh, anyway, we went to see the house, really nice house. Um, again, look, I'm not the best person to give any advice on buying a first house because that involves emotions. And as far as property goes, it's always been a means to an end to me. It's making money. And so I always look at it I want to get the best deal. So I, I said I said to Lauren, hey, look, I will we'll buy this house if I can get a really good deal on it. And so we started the negotiating process. Now, unfortunately, and I hope they're not listeners of the show, uh, the people that we were negotiating uh, against were painful. Uh, and the reason for that is because uh, I think he's a doctor. And so they've got a lot of money and – Doctors aren't great at respecting people's time. I mean, let's face it, you go to the doctors, the reception area is called a waiting room. You, you have to wait. So so anyway, we start this negotiating process and I know that the property had been on the market for a number of years. Now, they'd listed it themselves privately. So I've done it in my research. They'd listed it privately. Now, normally when someone lists it privately, they're either not that serious or they're wanting too much money and, an age, and they don't want to pay the agent. And so um, they'd done that. It hadn't sold. Then they then they listed through a real estate agent, a big firm in Christchurch, and uh, and I believe they actually got a, a a very reasonable offer, much more reasonable than mine, which they didn't take. Uh, and then and then they're building a house at the same time, so I don't think they're in a rush. Now that their build is almost finished, there was a bit more time pressure. But again, they've got a lot of money. They're probably not going to just take the lowest offer. So we started the negotiating process and I thought, well, we've just come out of COVID lockdown. There's not going to be a lot of people in this market uh, and and probably not in this price bracket. So let's try a lowball offer. Roughly how low, not in terms of dollar terms, but percentage About terms. About 15 to 20% yeah. lower than kind of what they were they were expecting, and and so uh, I I knew that there was a relatively cheeky offer, but there are a few things I did to kind of sweeten the deal. Uh, at this point, we. Um, I, I attached a check for the deposit, so that's that's a, an old trick that Tony Mounts told me. Attach, attach a check for your deposit and make it a reasonable deposit, so they know you're serious and that you've got the money to pay the deposit. Was it about a ten percent deposit? I think we did a ten percent deposit, um, and and obviously that's fully refundable because this is a conditional contract, so it's just, it doesn't really mean anything, but it just shows them that you got some dough. So we did that, um, and and I made it a very clean offer. I made it subject to a limb and title. I made it subject to a builder's report because this is a house that was built pre-earthquakes, uh, so very important in Christchurch, and I made it subject to finance. That's it. Made it really, really clear. And and the big thing about uh, finance now is you can't just pull out on a finance clause. You have to be able to prove that you were unable to get finance. So it's not the old due diligence clause that we used to just throw it in there and then cancel it. Like you, you, it was actually, you know, a very, very clean offer. 
Anyway, I did tell the agent um, who was a, who, who, who was uh, through a friend of mine who was also an agent, or Mickey Limmer, who was a guest on the show. He, he's my friend. He represented my side of things. He took it to the other agent, and that other agent presented to them, and I stressed to him, make sure they know that the world has changed now. We're in a post-COVID uh, environment. There are not a lot of people out there buying houses. Um, the property You can expect to get less. I would take this offer. Now, they wanted to sleep on it because it was obviously significantly less than what they wanted. I said, I've got no problem with that. Um, a very, very unfortunate uh, thing happened the next day. Uh, on the Saturday, uh, the first day of them sleeping on it over the weekend, I was on the front page of the newspaper saying how great the market was. <laughs> <laughs> so um, unfortunately, I'd given a couple of quotes to a, uh, st- uh, a reporter a few days earlier to that. I didn't expect the article to come out quite so soon. And so they counted at um, 300000 more. Um, so I got my offer back on Monday um, with an additional $300,000, which was wild. We needed to come closer. So anyway, we had to we had to use some other tactics then. So what I'd do, anytime I'd make an offer subject to that, uh, uh, sorry, Um, subsequent to that one thing that I often do is I'll add in more chattels now these guys uh, uh, the wife was actually a a, um, antique dealer or something like that so they're beautiful furniture much more tasteful than I would ever choose and so we would add in a few extra things and so that was one one thing so I felt like I was winning a little bit more Um, I I came up quite significantly in my next offer uh, to try and you know get this across the line because at this stage you know it had been a relative it might have taken a week for this process to go through and at this stage Lauren's getting a bit panicky about it and saying don't you lose this house because you want to get a deal um uh one one other tactic that i did which this is fairly uncommon but if you're negotiating a reasonable size deal i always do things like this now if people have got high expectations you need to anchor them at a lower price so what I did is I sent him my friend Johnny Little, who's a very experienced uh, real estate uh, investor in, in Christchurch, and he went through the house as a second person looking to make an offer. Now what Johnny did was made an offer even less than mine, and so that showed then that the market maybe wasn't actually as high as what they thought. Now they they uh, they counted again much higher with him, and and then actually he made his offer very complex by chucking in some land here and doing a swap with this, and so of course now we're trying to make my offer look better, not necessarily on price but on tidiness. So we go back and forward on this. Um, I managed to get the contract secured at a price. So they say a good negotiation leaves both parties dissatisfied. This was the definition of a of a good negotiation because I don't think either party was overly happy with the price. Anyway, we, we managed to get under contract and it was conditional. Um, now, I use my conditional phase to, cons- to further my negotiation. So one of my conditions was the building report. So I had a building report go through, uh, extensively look at the house, and I, my goal was to use anything that came in that up in that builder's report to renegotiate price. Unlucky for me, the builder's report came in perfect, and so it was very hard to prove any uh, issue or fault of the house. Um, so we couldn't do anything there. In the end, we we confirmed at that price at the 11th hour. If you are going to renegotiate in your due, due diligence period, I suggest doing it at the last minute. So in this case, I only had two weeks. I oh, actually, sorry, I only had a week. I only had a five-day uh, finance clause. Uh, my finance was already approved, so that was that was satisfactory. Uh, in this market, you you know, if you haven't got your finance approved, you kind of need ten to fifteen days. Uh, but in this case, we were able to satisfy the bank uh, the last conditions once we had that contract in place. At the last minute, I would have asked for a price adjustment had it not been that these vendors were kind of digging their toes in and they weren't really providing me with the information I needed for insurance so I thought we might lose the deal um, but if I if it hadn't have been for myself and I hadn't had uh, pressure from Lauren I probably would have pushed a little bit further and or walked away from the deal if I hadn't been able to get a little bit of extra money off it. Now it's quite interesting because there are there is a lot or there are a lot of different negotiation techniques in there that we can just pluck out a bit. You know, first of all, the idea of putting attaching the check as a deposit so that people see the number of zeros on the check and and think, gosh, that's a lot of money. I could cash this now and have that in our in our account or at least secured. Now actually that's very similar and I'm pretty sure that this was actually in Michael Hill's book where he was trying to buy You'll correct me because you've read them as well. Uh, where he was trying to buy a, a car off somebody that they'd won 
run through a drawer or something, and he ended up going down there with a briefcase of cash. Uh, yeah, yeah, when yeah. they when the uh, when the owner of the car said no, so he takes down a, a briefcase of cash and shows him the money. Yes, you yes, know, yes. It's very it's much harder to say no when the money's right in front of you, uh, and, and and definitely that that cash does does work a trick. Now, um, actually, just another couple of tips um, that we that I've used in the past and and for different uh, environments such as an auction or a tender. Now, auctions, I remember Tony Mount saying to me before my first auction, just remember the person that bids last wins. Now, um, you know, that seems obvious when you think about the way an auction works, but what he was actually saying is just keep your hands in your pocket. Now, often, if you're going along to an auction, you'll have agents tell you things like, oh, we expect it to go more than $500,000. Now, this is probably actually going to go for 600000 but they get a lot of people thinking that 500000 might buy it. And so then they bring along as many of the first-home buyers as they can who are emotionally invested and they use them to build a bit of momentum. And that was me at my first auction as well. I got completely blitzed. And so what what you want to do in an auction is actually say nothing, do nothing, keep your hands in your pocket, and remember that there's two stages to an auction. There's the first negotiate there's sorry, the, the first set of bidding, and then the property until you hear the words the property is now on the market. It's not actually, even if you win there, you you haven't won. The property isn't on the market. So you're best just to sit back and do nothing. So the way I would suggest winning an auction, you do nothing until the last minute. You let everyone else exhaust theirs and then go in at 10,000 more. Go in at 20,000 more. Blow the others out of the market and just keep doing that and scare people off. Um, again, one of my friends in uh, Melbourne, what they do, they've got a uh, buyer's advocacy service that you pay money for over there and the market is very hot. So obviously that's a, that's got huge advantages. And one of the things that they would do is, again, they'd use a two-pronger to protect, uh, attack. They would have his wife go in and she'd be representing their purchaser and then he'd go in and then he would slow down the auction. So what he would do is he'd start bidding in smaller increments. And then at some stage he would scream, oh, this is ridiculous, it's way too much, and storm out and scare off a few of the other buyers. So there are things like that. If you're buying a tender, which is very popular in Wellington, one thing that I would do there is I'd make my offer as clean as possible. I would always go in at the price that I don't want to lose the property at. And then I'd try and negotiate more off afterwards because of course you might be presented with 10 offers they want a nice offer and a and a um and a clean offer i'd try and probably get an extension of i'd get going with five days as 10 days to begin with then i'd ask for another 10 days we're now almost a month into the contract and then i'd ask for a discount so that's another sort of tactic that i i'd use in the past so just to summarize all of those money up front in terms of putting the check in for the deposit Keep the clauses and the contract very, very simple, a very, very clean offer. And if you believe that you're going to be only one of several people uh, uh, making an offer, stress the new environment at the moment. Stress the things that are potentially not going to go well for the vendor to get them uh, into a more accepting state. Uh, If you really want to include a bit of theatre, (laughs) <laughs> uh, which we, which we've talked about. You could use a straw man and get a get a friend to go in, or use bring somebody in for an auction. Uh, and if they are coming back asking for higher prices, then get some ask for something. Whether it's chattels, whether it's uh, better clauses, whether it's whatever it happens to be, so that if you are going up on price, that you're getting something back for it. Uh, and and then. As well, once you're going through DD, that's a time where you can look to massage the price as well. So quite a few little nuggets of gold to use in there next time you're negotiating for a property. And if you really can't be bothered with any of this, you can use a service like us where it's already pre-negotiated for you. So, I mean, I guess using a service of a, of a property coach or, or, or similar, we pre-negotiate contracts for you so you don't have to do all of this stuff. Now, of course, don't forget to rate, review and subscribe to the podcast. Really does help us get the message out to more people. And hey... We are announcing today our podcast tour, our national podcast tour. Mid-September, the 15th, 16th and 17th of September, we're coming to Christchurch, Wellington and Auckland. Starting at 6pm, doors open from 5.30. This is going to be a free event where we'll put on the food and the drinks and we're going to do a couple of live podcast recordings and you'll be able to ask us anything. And this is really an opportunity to meet your fellow podcast listeners, to build a bit of a community and talk with some like-minded people and to get to know us better. We're really looking forward to it. I'm going to 
link up to where you can sign up for those in the show notes or just go to opuspartners.co.nz slash pod event. Thanks for listening to the Property Academy podcast. I'm your host, Ed McKnight. And I'm Andrew Nichol. And we're going to be back again tomorrow with even more daily strategies, tactics and insights to help you get the most out of the New Zealand property market. Until next time, 